looking forward to the future, uh, we now have our nominees for, for president and for vice president. I know that you were on um, the special on the Young Turks earlier this week talking about um, the, it was the immediate aftermath of Kamala Harris being chosen as the VP pick for, for Joe Biden. Now that we know that those are our two nominees, as someone who has spent the, the vast majority of your life advocating for American workers, what do you think about the prospects under a Biden Harris administration for strengthening um, you know, labor protections, labor rights, and, and all of that. How is how is that battle going to go over the next four years? Well, I have a lot of hope, and that is because uh, one thing about Joe Biden, he's always been on the side of American workers, and uh, we know that uh, the rights of workers have been uh, really de- decreased. Uh, they've been uh, made weaker. You know, but workers. One good example of this is that workers at the state level and the national level have been asking for a long time for recognition. So that when workers are trying to get recognition at the workplace, that they can do this by simply signing a card to say, I want my, I want to be represented by X union. Well, okay, that has been turned down time and again, voted down. And you think about it, if your signature is good enough to get married, to own a car, to get a mortgage on your house, to get a divorce, you know, then that that your signature should be good enough to say, I want my union to represent me. And the other big problem that unions have right now, they win elections, but they can never get a contract because the employers take them to court, they do all these stalling techniques. And so the protections of not only workers, but of labor unions have to be strengthened. And here, you know, we're talking about, okay, $15 an hour should be a minimum wage. And we know that in California, that isn't enough. In California, a minimum wage should be $30 an hour. And then it's pathetic when we think of many of the states in our country that the minimum wage is $7 an hour, really. While we have these corporations that are getting richer, I mean, multi billionaires and, and and the way they treat their workers, people like Amazon, you know, they brag about how many electric cars are going to buy and they're going to do this stuff for global warming. Hey, but what about your own workers? You know, mm-hmm. they, they, all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, drive through the, uh, the fast food station. I mean, they, they, you know, they really exploit younger workers. They don't give them enough hours. Uh, companies like Walmart, where workers can't even get enough hours to get a health plan, you know, uh, and yet they, they make these billions of dollars. I mean, they can't eat the money, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> they use that money to give it to uh, the Republicans that they want to get elected instead of thinking at the workforce. So hopefully, you know, we, we know that during the depression of the 30s, and by the way, I was born during that depression, I'm 90 years old. But out of that depression uh, came a lot of great things for workers. That's when they passed the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, Social Security. And uh, hopefully, of course, we had a great president then uh, during that period of time. Uh, so uh, maybe now after, you know, during, after this crisis that we're living right now, this nightmare that we're living, uh, when this comes out, maybe we can come out of it a lot stronger when it comes to economic rights and labor rights and, and universal health care, all of the things that people are, are really, you know, really working very hard uh, to make happen. Yeah, I, I, I obviously, I certainly hope so. And, um, you know, one of the things that has helped to sustain me during the, the period that Trump has been president is that um, virtually from the beginning, We have had people who have been organizing actively and publicly around a number of issues, whether it's you know opposing his his Muslim bans or the changes in immigration, the locking up of children, on through to the civil rights protests that we have going on right now. People have been very active. One fear that I have is that once Trump is gone, that there might not be as much of a a fire. For getting out in the streets and and making your voice heard effectively, that hey, we'll have gotten past him. Maybe things aren't so bad. Do you think that that fear is is wrong? Do you think that 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 people will still be pushing for you know even if it is Biden to to pass some of the the changes that you mentioned there? That they'll still be active in response to the the inequities that they see in America. Oh, absolutely. I think this young generation of marchers and protesters, they're not going to sit, they're not going to be quiet. We also know that in the House of Representatives, the Progressive Caucus right now is the largest caucus that they have in the House of Representatives. And so you have people that are working on these issues. They've been working on them for a long time and they're going to keep, they're going to keep plugging. And I think we're going to get the more progressive people elected. And I think you know, right now in this election, but definitely after the next election, I believe in, in uh, 
2022, uh, we're going to see more progressives that are elected. And that's the one thing I think that we, uh, the one danger that we have is, is that young people will not vote. That all of those people that are protesting out there, that they don't believe in quote unquote government, so to speak, and they don't realize how important it is that the things that we are fighting for, that they have to be enacted in terms of laws, legislation. Because if you don't have legislation, then you can't implement the changes that you want. And then, then there's no accountability. We have to have accountability and enforcement of the type of changes that we want. Otherwise, you know, they might make some uh, changes, uh, you might say, uh, cosmetic changes right now, you know, to take the heat off of them. Uh, and I'm thinking right now, the large corporations that are putting out these nice ads and about Black Lives Matter. But hey, we want more than that. We want, yeah, we want. Black Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter, you know, Indigenous Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter, but we want more than that. We got, we have to get rid of this horrible income inequality that, that we have, where you have 10% of the corporation and the wealthy families like Walmart that own 90% of the wealth of, of this country. The resources of the United States of America, the richest country in the world, are not supposed to be in the hands of 10% uh, of the corporations. I'm sorry, but those resources belong to every single citizen and resident of the United States of America, not just to yeah. the, the greedy few or the wealthy few, whichever way you want to you yeah. know, identify them. Um, you know, the last question I'll ask you is you mentioned there that we we have some some good progressives that have got gotten elected recently. Some are winning primaries even you know in the past few weeks. Um, and then you also mentioned that we have these corporations who are trying to pass off you know a, a slick ad as replacing actual change being done. So I have the same sort of fear with politicians that it's become very popular to present yourself as a progressive. Everyone seems to support the Green New Deal at least in their rhetoric. So I'm curious as, as someone who is You've been around and you've seen politicians, some of them good, some of them not so trustworthy. Um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for your read on these people. Who are some of the individuals in politics that you see as being particularly trustworthy, um, you know, that we should keep an eye on, on, on issues affecting American workers in, in the future? Well, I, lo I love to talk about the squad, <laughs> you know, these young women uh, that are now in the Congress uh, led by AOC uh, and by Ms. Cortez. I think that they are kind of the leaders in this, you know, they're very, very vocal. Uh, people are really looking up to them. Uh, we have, again, I mentioned the Progressive Caucus. Uh, we have uh, Congressman Raul Gurijalva from Arizona, who was a big, big leader and committed to the whole issue of the environment. Uh, and I do believe that uh, the president will listen to them. I know it's always hard for them uh, because they get pressure from both sides. They get pressure from the big corporations. But the other thing too, you know, this isn't talked about a lot, but I want to mention it because I, I think it's something that we have to put at the top of the agenda. And I'm talking about public campaign reforms. Because as long as all the politicians have to sit there and they have to make those calls to get money, you know, which takes up by probably half of the time that they're in office, which they should be really committing that time to legislating. Uh, we have this the fundamental weakness in, in, in government, in, in, in electing people to government. Because if, if, if the person that gets elected is the one that can raise the most money. And this is wrong. We've got to be able to elect people on the issues that they that they support, you know, on the on the record that they stand on, and it should not be related to money. So I hope that people will kind of kind of dial back and start looking at this as something that we have to really focus on. And I think everybody in the public will say, yeah, I'll give a few dollars. So that people don't have to spend all their money raising money, because it's not often how great the candidate is. It's how much money he has. And unfortunately, I think the institutions like the Democratic National Committee, they are part of the problem, you know, because mm -hmm. they also go along with this. If you don't have the money, my, my son ran for Congress and he's a public interest attorney, has always done nonprofit work. And, and, and with liberal issues, but you know, because he couldn't raise the millions of dollars that, that they say you have to have before we'll, we will even help you. We won't even put you on this uh, red to blue list, you know, or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And uh, because you don't have the money. Well, that means that we're always going to be subjected to have millionaires represent us and not because the, the majority of the people in the United States of America are not millionaires. So how can we all always expect millionaires to have our best interests at heart? Not saying that some of them don't, they do. 
But for the majority, and I'm talking about all of the senators that are on vacation right now, while people are hurting, you know, this is the result that we get. Uh, I agree. I think it's it's the issue at the heart of so many other issues we're trying to deal with. And uh, Dolores Huerta, I want to thank you for joining us on the show. It's, it's an honor to be able to speak to you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And people can learn more about our organization. Uh, look, our, our website is DoloresHuerta.org. DoloresHuerta.org. Thank you very much. You're welcome. For more political news breakdowns, interviews, stories of activism, and me trying my hardest to care about the occasional big celebrity news story, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the damage report. And you can ring the bell wherever it is so you don't miss anything.